everyone. Welcome to Magstar. My name is Kiran. I'm the director for product management. And today, I'll just go over the overview of how Magstar is implemented and so on. And then, from a technology point of view, Raghu and Christian will get much deeper into it. So just to give you an overview of how Maxta works, right? So here in this architectural representation, uh, think of each of these big blue dotted boxes are a host, right? And this host could be a VMware host, I mean ESX, or it could be a KVM host, which is either Red Hat or CentOS or any of those. So now you'll of course have the hypervisor installed and we'll install a piece of software on each one of those hosts. And the form factor in which this runs is slightly different between the different hypervisors. So in VMware, we run as a VM. In KVM, we run as a process. So now what these process or Maxter instances would do is they would aggregate the storage resources. And these are all internal storage resources within the server. Um, and this could be a combination of spinning disks as well as SSDs. And this flash in general, and this could be uh, EMLC SSDs, it could be PCIe, it could be NVMe, the latest uh, uh, PCI technology, any of those. And we aggregate the storage resources, present it as a global namespace, back to the hypervisor. Right. So now... The so, Kieran, sorry, I've yeah. got my back to you, but oh, oh, you've got to go back to me. So it's <laughs> going to be awkward. Probably I, I should move back. That's all right, you're fine there, but it's going to be awkward when I ask you a question, so you sure. have to turn around. Go ahead. Um, <coughs> why do you insist that <coughs> um, when you install on a new node that you have to delete all of the existing data stores? as part of the installation process? No, okay. It's a very good question. Now, um, Chris Evans is asking, hey, why would you want to delete the data stores that's already there? No, you, you don't have to delete the data stores that's already there. See, if you have a VMFS data store, you can continue to run. When, during the installation process, you have to select the drives that you want us to use. And the drives that we use, we will delete everything. So if you have a 12 drive bay server and you have fully populated, and during installation, you could say, I want to use eight drives because I know they are empty. And the four drives are using some VMFS data store and we won't touch those. Or if you have even presented uh, iSCSI LAN or a fiber channel LAN, we won't touch it. That will continue to run as is. But the eight but, drives, but we will drive. The drives you it. have, you have to own. Yes. The drives we have, uh, we use, we own it. Okay. Okay. And, and you're accessing those drives through the VMware stack, yes. not IO direct path. Yes, we are accessing. And uh, definitely, um, the, uh, uh, Raghu and Christian will get into the details on how it's accessed also. Yes. So now we. Uh, I'm sorry, can you support, do you support network storage behind you, or is it always direct access storage? Um, network storage comes in different flavors, right? So if it's a SAN fabric, uh, meaning fiber channel or iSCSI, we can support it, but it's not recommended because there is no big business value yeah. proposition. Uh, if it's like direct attached, it could be internal or even a JBot. We support those configurations. Well, wouldn't you act as a server-side cache if I had a local SSD and took a LUN off my array and told you to manage it? Yes, I mean, you can. But, the, I mean, the server, especially for some of the older SAN, it might make sense. But if I have a NetApp or an EMC, VNX, I mean, I've already paid millions of dollars, right? I mean, you would you not. You know what those guys charge for SSDs? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so technically speaking, we need a block device to support. The block device could be internal, could be external. Whatever it is, we'll grab it and we'll leverage it. And you are absolutely correct. If you got a server-side flash and we got a disk drive LAN, we will, in a lot of senses, and we'll talk about it, provide caching in front of an external storage. Right. But, it's, also but it's not the design goal. It's not it's the goal of market. Design. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, can and should different. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if we said that earlier today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we take this global namespace and present it back to ESX. And from a communication uh, between the Maxtra internal nodes, we leverage the standard Ethernet, uh, 1 gig, 10 gig. Uh, we have, uh, as Yoram pointed out, the branch uh, offices customers, they all use one gig. And if they are on one gig, we prefer it to be a dedicated port for Maxta. And if it's 10 gig, uh, we can share it, it can be dedicated. And we have a lot of customers running on 10 gig also. Uh, 
and one of the things that we emphasized from a design point of view all the way from the beginning is to provide enterprise class services. I mean, its storage is pretty critical in any organization. You would want to have your entire stack of storage capabilities, right? If you look at from a data integrity point of view, we do it from the ground up, provide very efficient data integrity. Um, all the data protection features, snapshots and clones. Actually, we have customers who have tested us with 5,000 snapshots on a single VM without any performance degradation. And of course, with no single point of failure, with high availability across uh, capacity optimization features, and as Joram pointed out, linear scalability in multiple dimensions. Uh, so you can scale compute, you can scale storage, you can scale both compute and storage, so you have different options of scaling. And it makes a lot of sense, especially say in a VDI environment where we have customers who have started off with 400 desktops, but now they want to scale. Oh, they have enough storage already, right? So they want to just add some compute resources. You add a compute server uh, and the, we'll install a piece of software, of course, on this, and we will start to uh, share this, the shared storage will be used to present it. And, and data protection is erasure code, RAID replication? It's RAID replication. So RAID 1. RAID 1. So and it can have multiple copies also. This might go back to uh, the, one of the previous presentations, but from a support perspective for your partners, yeah. do we go to the retailer, the distributor? Who do we go to for support? Uh, you can call Maxtra as a first line of support. And we are also members of the TSA net. Uh, which will essentially bring the collaboration between multiple vendors. We are a Platinum TSA Net uh, pro, uh, member. So we have all the big server vendors as part of it, VMware is part of it. Um, so we have a direct channel communication between our support organization and their support organization. The customers can call Maxter as a first line of support. Let me add one thing. As part of our partner program, we provide the ability for some of the partner to uh, join our training to provide level one and level two. And we provide them the financial benefits to provide level one and level two. Some of them signed up and they are going to be level one and level two. Mm -hmm. In other cases, with the, when the channel just want to sell it, they want to do the SKU and to sell it, we provide the support. Yeah, there, there's big VVAR and little VVAR. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so from a SKU perspective, the you know we talk a lot about scaling up and scaling out when someone wants to buy this in an appliance and we choose to scale up yeah. uh, how is that handled is that a call to the partner yes. to have additional memory or additional storage yes. or yes CPU? yeah they would call the partner and say hey I want 10 more terabytes of capacity and here is a server that I have they look at the compatibility list for the drives it's tested they will uh, send it to them and they can add those drives to the servers. Okay. And, and what's the software price model? The software pricing model is based on raw capacity. Okay, so so when I got those more disk drives, yes. I have to pay you guys as yes. well? Yes, yes. Okay. And you have to be like for like for as far as uh, scaling additional nodes or can you be oddly shaped node counts of different generations. Yeah, it can be oddly shaped nodes, uh, but we don't want it to be so odd that it's hard and for it us to do some problems. balancing and yeah. so on, but some variations, perfectly fine. Sure. We will handle it. It's as opposed to being hard set into you must use the exact same generation no matter yes. what. And yes. Or, or the exact same storage configuration. Yeah. yeah. You know, the vSAN guys really want you to run yeah. every node the same. Exactly. Um, and, and you only charge for the nodes that are providing storage, not for the ones that are consuming storage. Yes, I mean, it's based on raw capacity. So, yes, you can add any number of nodes which do not uh, provide storage, and they are not charged. You're basically buying a quota, and you can, you can distribute it in any number of servers, and you can have in as many additional compute servers as you want. Now, do, you, from do you use the flash as part of the raw capacity, or as a cache? cache. Uh, Very good, good question. question. No, no. And as far as the licensing... From, from a licensing point of view, it's not charged. Okay. Licensing is based upon raw capacity or usable capacity because the concern is at a RAID 1 with multiple copies, you get like a 25% usable space. Yeah. And uh, then, so if you're licensed by raw capacity, we may have a problem. But if it's on usable capacity, that isn't so bad. No, let me explain. So generally, let's assume that you do two copies of your data, mm -hmm. right? If you are licensed on raw capacity, yeah, it effect effectively comes down to half. But with all the capacity optimization features that we have, we have easily seen that our customers get anywhere from 
two to five x uh, benefit easy. So we will get back all the uh, capacity that we took up because of having to make a copy. So essentially raw capacity a lot of times works in the favor of the customer because mm -hmm. you could say, hey, I have five terabytes of capacity, but my usable could be 15. You're not paying for usable. You're paying for just the raw. And, and I'll add another thing. If you're using a lot of snapshot and snapshots and clones, the customer really benefit from raw capacity because the capacity is shared because in the case that Kieran talked, 5,000 snapshots. So that's the way it works. Exactly. So in, in general, <laughs> uh, if you want to um, buy Maxta for 100 terabyte uh, of usable capacity, you uh, end up buying 100 terabyte raw, not 200 terabyte raw, because uh, uh, whatever overhead uh, network rate one brings, so we kind of like, uh, you know, compensate for that through uh, all our space efficiency uh, and, uh, you know, optimization for your functionality. Uh, Christian will get into some of those details. Yeah. Perfect. And then, uh, just in the interest of time, let me quickly cover the simplicity aspect of it. Um, we are very tightly integrated into the virtualization user interface. Makes it really simple, minimizes the learning curve of the end user. Um, and also, we offer a, a breadth of policy management, policy-based management, which makes it really simple for users. So we all realize they're not sitting in front of the computer all the time, right? They need to be, set, they need to set up, they should forget about it, right? So we'll go into the details in the architecture on how these policies, the different things that you can set and so on. And multi-hypervisor support has been very well received in the market. Uh, especially we have had customers who are always looking at dual hypervisor strategy in their data center. They don't want to have just one hypervisor. It doesn't mean that they're going to get rid of the other. It just means that they want to have the flexibility of choosing a different hypervisor when required. So it's been received very well uh, in the industry for us with VMware, KVM, and OpenStack. And I'll show you a demo of the KVM uh, and also the OpenStack, just to give you an idea. Most of you guys have seen the VMware part here, but we'll show you on the others. Um, to quickly summarize, and. Uh, give it to the technical uh, architects. Uh, the key value that Maxta brings to the end customers is primarily to maximize choice. You get the servers that you can use um, you, from different multiple vendors. Uh, it, leverages, it leverages the hypervisors, any hypervisor you want. Today, from the architecture, we support, uh, I mean, the architecture is designed to support other hypervisors, but KVM, VMware, OpenStack, uh, we support those today. And uh, also, we support, from a storage device point of view, what's quite interesting is customers can easily adopt the newer technology. Uh, things like, say, the NVMe technology. Well, Maxter was the first, from a storage vendor point of view, to support NVMe when Intel announced it. On day zero that Intel announced at IDF uh, 2014, we were right there with them to support the NVMe technology. So it really helps oh, yeah. them. I mean you need the hypervisor to support it. Yes. Fortunately, VMware was there with us, yeah. right? So definitely, there, absolutely. You, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, um, you, you were there first because, you know, from you had storage, help. From, from a storage, <laughs> storage point of view. Yeah. I covered myself from a storage point of view. <laughs> <laughs> so you have client software and server software that gets deployed or just server software? Uh, it's just server software. So the client is already right through the KVM or virtual machine hyper yeah. service. Well, you, the, you publish the... the the data, the storage via standard protocol. Yes, it's. I mean, for KV, I mean, on the VMware side, we present ourselves as NFS. <coughs> on the KVM side, we present ourselves as a block device. So, if you present yourself through NFS, can it be presented externally to physical devices, yeah. physical servers? Yes. Perfect. Perfect question. Um, actually, architecturally, yes, you you can do it. <laughs> but as a company, being a small company, we have to choose where we really excel and where we support. Are you so, stopping customers from doing it? Uh, we don't support it. Yes. Are you, <laughs> that's a different question. You don't It'll provide the full way, set yeah. of POSICs. Yeah. It, it is, actually. I mean, the file system is completely POSIC compliant. Oh. Well, yeah, okay. so, uh, uh, you know, on, on uh, KVM, for example, right? So, uh, as Kiran mentioned, uh, we run inside the alongside the hypervisor, and uh, we expose a full-fledged file system back to the uh, application. So uh, we are using a very thin filter driver in the kernel, so we glue ourselves to the VFS layer in Linux, and uh, we are fully POSIX compatible. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, and of course, from a maximizing the cost perspective, we talked quite a bit about it, leveraging industry standard servers. Um, you could get the benefit. You don't have to uh, invest in a storage array. And we all understand the fundamental 
thing from a storage platform is not to compromise on the data services and the data integrity. That's you, built from the ground up. Do you require a certain number of disks per SSD configurations or anything like that? Yes. So the average, yes. Uh, the, the, yes. And uh, the there are two models. One is you, if we have the concept of a meta dev that uh, Christ, uh, Christian will get into. If you enable those, it's 10% of your HDD should be an SSD. If you don't, then it's 5% of your HDD capacity has to be an SSD. And Hyper-V support? I mean, you're fully KVM and VMware, but in 2013, you talked about Hyper-V a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, from an architecture point of view, it's V. It's uh, agnostic to it, but from a support point of view, uh, we haven't built the support, and it's not GA. So, so sure, that's fair. Yes. Yeah, no, th that's a good question, and that's in our roadmap. Use mm -hmm. NFS we are focusing on containers. So cannot. protocol issues. Yes, there are more enhancements okay. that we have to do. I always thought of this won't, but... Uh, 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 yeah, so uh, just, just, just to... Uh, yeah, it's an IFS in the Linux, though. Uh, j just to answer your question, actually, so uh, the architecture is so flexible that we can uh, expose the file system in multiple ways to uh, Hyper-V. Uh, so one option is, uh, you know, we can take the same approach we took on uh, KVM. Uh, you know, just run uh, the entire file system stack in the user space of Hyper-V and expose the file system through a, uh, you know, filter driver uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to to Hyper-V parent partition. So that is one approach, of course, you know, uh, safe or, space. Or you could write a whole SMB3 stack. Yeah. 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 But either way, there's yeah. protocol issues yeah, yeah mm. I, I agree. Yeah, but 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 what I want to say here is uh, the architecture is flexible, and you have multiple yeah. options. Mm -hmm. Is there is there a requirement in the dis the disk drives to be higher performance, like 10k RPM, or can you use 7200 RPM drives? Yeah, you can use 7200 RPM drives, and Christian is going to talk uh, quite a bit about it. Yes, uh, actually, you can. we most of the time recommend using high capacity 7200 RPM disk drive and flash because we found that from a cost performance, that's the best combination that you have. So in most cases, unless you really have performance requirement and cost is less of an issue, we would recommend 7200 RPM disk drives. So, so have you found that in general, m more flash and slower disk drives is better than less flash and faster disk drives? Uh, we did find that initially, as you increase the flash uh, capacity, the ratio, you get huge a benefit and then it slows down. Yeah, you, so that's you why the point of we, we, we believe that, again, uh, it depends on whether we use flash for metadata or not, but above 10%, it's diminishing return of adding more and more cost of flash to the, to the picture. As far as uh, the number of servers, can you fully populate an ESX cluster with max store server? I mean, how, is there a limitation? No, there is no, uh, there is no technical limitation. We have, we have had customers who have fully populated, say, uh, even on the Cisco platform with all 24 one terabyte drives and they have four terabytes, uh, four uh, servers with 100 terabytes, fully populated. Um, so absolutely there is no uh, max, to, from a max point of view, there is no limit. But so it was you are not supporting today uh, full flash configuration. It does not make sense. No. We support it and we'll talk about, we are not optimized for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I, we don't, we want to be really uh, straight with this. Our design is for a hybrid, and we optimize it, as Christian will tell you, for hybrid. You can populate it with all flesh. Mm -hmm. We will not get all the benefits that you would do with a fully optimized solution just for flesh. That's something that is in our roadmap. Okay, e even if the end user uses very low end uh, SSD drives, so a few bright uh, capable drives. Yeah, w what we really need is uh, an SSD with uh, with a capacitor, so that uh, we don't lose when we lose power to the drives, we don't lose data. Th mm -hmm. That's that's the fundamental thing. It, uh, it's EMLC is fine from different vendors is fine. Uh, so the bare minimum is we need an EMLC SSD. Yeah, you know, Santos mm -hmm. got one that's four terabytes. So. Sure. You know, you have to mortgage your house, but it's four terabytes. <laughs> <laughs>